in the Heilige Tanya. And we were speaking yesterday about bringing the analogy of God's oneness closer to home by using the analogy of the light coming off the Ma'or while the or is still inside its source in the sun. And the unification of the sun and the light coming off the sun, when we look at the light coming off the sun, while it's still in the sun, we don't say there's a sun and light. We say the whole thing is just the ma'or. And that was the way of understanding Hashem and His attributes, which is that which He's spreading forth, that the unification of God, the ma'or, and the light that comes off, the midos, while the, the midos are, so to speak, in Hashem, which they are, there's absolute unity in that place. Mikol makom. In order to again soothe our ears to try to understand such deep, beautiful concepts, Nishma Venis Boinin, let us listen and understand the Mashal Or Hashemish, the light of the sun, Hameyuchod, that's one, the bottle bimekoyre, that's absolutely nullified to its source. The Eina Oil Beshem Klal Bifne Atzmai. The light has no name, which means all of God's attributes. The way that God is kind in the world, the way that God is just, the way that God deals with judgment, all of these are attributes. And we see God sometimes as acting more with justice, more with uh, kindness, with compassion. All of those elements of God, when we look at them connected to God, they're one with Hashem, like the light of the sun while the light is still in the sun. Raksham hamakor levadoi kach. Oh, all you see there is the sun. You just see God. Ka kol bochu. So too it is with all of the Elements of God, God's wisdom. God's wisdom and God are all one. God's wisdom, God and His wisdom are not two different things. A complete one. You can only speak of God's wisdom from our perspective, when we're looking from our perspective at the light emerging from the sun. You get what I'm saying? But while the light is still inside the sun, you don't say that it's a separate thing called God's wisdom. You just say it's God. Can you see the light? Can you see the light outside of the sun from within the sun? Like as the rays spread out, uh, I, I, maybe I'm thinking about this from like too physical of a perspective, but like if you're in the sun. See, from God's perspective. From God's perspective. From God's perspective, all there is, is God. Then he can see the rays of the sun, but he also knows that those rays of the That's sun right. are also just him. That's right. Only from our perspective is there, so to speak, a ray that's coming off the sun. But from God's perspective, the ray never left the sun. But isn't the ray leaving the sun? From our perspective. But the more you get into the way that God sees the world, which is the truth of the world, the more you're tracing your ray back into the sun. And the closer you get, the less you have the self, you know, identity. Like, look at me, you know? You become much more humble as you make the journey back into the sun. I was just learning, actually, in Nefesh that he speaks about the whole beginning of idol worship. It's very important. I just opened up the page. That's very good. So he says... Good sign, really. Yeah. It's a hug from Hashem. Right? Yeah. Ela dor haya. What was the beginning of the problem of how idol worship originated? They thought, right. So, you have to learn the Rambam in the beginning of the laws of idol worship. It's very important reading. 
Okay? Everybody should open up a Rambam at the beginning of the laws of idol worship. Shechashfu, and he's basing a lot of this on Rambam. Shechashfu b'shibush daitam, that they thought in a mixed up way, ki ram Hashem, Hashem is far from us, ve'ala shemaim kevoidoi, he's beyond us, ve'ein kevoidoi lahashgiach al brue ze'a oilam ha'shofel. And it's not in the honor of the king, in God's honor, to look at lowly mortal beings like us. So they started to make this distance. Remember, from God's perspective, it's just God. Nothing is lowly. It's all God. They started to feel far away like these self, too much independence and separation from God. And therefore, they looked at themselves like these separate beings, like, who, you know, what would God want to do with me? Now, pay attention, they knew God, but they started to feel more and more distant, as if their ray was like going distant and further and further from the sun. More, and therefore more independence, more self-identity. L'chein chashfu shahoser hu yisbon hashka chasoy mehem. They thought that Hashem is not therefore involved with us. Why would He want to be? And Hashem then therefore gave over the control of creation to his ministers, which includes all the stars. And we don't mean the stars, we mean the angels above the stars. That's why when people are, you know, when ancient civilizations talk about astrology, and being connected to the stars, it means that they're connecting to angelic forces that are being symbolized by the stars. And when people are worshiping Mars and Pluto and all the mythology around the world, and people doing rain dances and sun dances, Hashem Yirachim, this is mamish idol worship, extremely forbidden. This was being birthed from a place of, because they felt like these separate beings from God, and they felt lowly, interesting, they felt lowly about themselves. A lot of people who, you know, who are like, you know, big macho guys, that people think, like, he's got such a big ego. Most of the problem there is not ego, it's actually lack of self-confidence. They actually feel like nobodies. So they put on this, uh, this, this outer game to make up for the lack inside of them of feeling like they're important. So here, people started feeling not so important, deep, deep sense of importance, and they started feeling low about themselves, and what would a God want to deal with us for? And therefore, it must be that He gave control to us, to His ministers, and therefore, if we want to get things done, we don't go to God anymore. We'll go to the intermediaries. And here you have a birthing of a humongous amount of idol worship, which also helps you understand, like, the ancients worshipping stars and worshipping powers. You go back into ancient civilizations, and there's a tremendous mythology, and it still exists today. And it's serious idol worship, forbidden. Look at this. They felt it's a chutzpah to go to Hashem. I'm like this lowly person. What, what, what do I have to do with the king? By the way, even though this might not seem like something that, you know, practically is relevant, even though it's exceptionally relevant, and you have to meditate on these words we're saying. But have you ever had a moment where, let's say, there was a great person, like maybe a, a grand rabbi, and then you thought to yourself, like, who am I to go over to them? Why are you saying that? Who are you not to go over? There's a similar point here, is you're saying, I'm like too lowly, I can't go speak. That's like people saying, I can't, I'm not comparing the person to God. 
But I'm showing you that a feeling of like, I'm lowly, I don't have connection. That's what I'm comparing, is that started happening to people around the world. That people thought, I can't speak to Hashem, it's a chutzpah. That I have to ask Hashem for my basic needs. He's so much more grand. Who, what does he want to hear from me? Some lowly guy, you know, talking to him about like my, you know, my chickens died and, you know, I need to be able to provide some parnasa for my family. What does he want to hear from me? Well, the more you think that you're far separate away from the source, the more a person could think that. But the more you see the world from Hashem's perspective, you're one with Hashem. Hashem is interested in you. You're very important. This is majorly problematic. And then, therefore, they started putting all their energy towards the intermediaries. So did they believe in a God? Like, like did they yes. believe in a, a single unified God? Yes. And That's a, that, that Adam was created by God. And this, this was in all of their, their traditions? This is showing how in the time of Enosh, things started to break down based on this philosophy. Who am I to go to the king? So it wasn't necessarily like to rebel against God. It was they just never felt worthy of speaking to God directly. And then what happens afterwards is that there becomes rebellion. Because the snake's original ploy was you could be like God. You could be like God. If I can make this stone my God, I can be a God too. You could be like God, which means you're separate. You have independent existence outside of God. You hear this? That's a problem. That's the same thing we're talking about now, is that if you see from your perspective as this ray of light getting further and further away, you start feeling like, look at me. This is what's called koichi v'oitzim yodi. That my strength and the power of my hand did that. We reject that. We cannot do anything without Hashem. Any, nothing. And therefore all idol worship comes from that I'm separate from Hashem. And then that leads to a feeling of who am I to go to Hashem? And it even leads to a feeling of, I don't even need Hashem anymore. Because look how separate I am. This is all the venom of the snake. Yes? Uh, are we supposed to be like partners with creation also? I mean, we have like, the power to create and destroy and yes. build things and also mess things up. So that shows the depth of how connected we are to Hashem. As Hashem says, I love you so much. I made you my partners in creation. That you and I are one. We're like partners in a business. We're literally in this together. And I'm going to run the world based on your decisions. At the same time as I'm going to make sure the world gets to its completion. This is called Hanhagas HaYichud and Hanhagas HaMishpat, which operate at the same time. Which means God is running the world based on our decisions. Hopefully that we build the world and not do the opposite. But at the same time, if God sees that we're getting too off course, God forbid, then Hashem will keep steering us in the direction for humanity that we need to go in. But don't rely on that, because Hashem says, you could have been part of bringing the world to its perfection. And one of the ways to do that is to know that you are my partner and all the energy that you have is coming from me. The more you know that you're part of the sun, Hashem is not a sun, but you're part of the source, the more that you align with that mission. And then the great secret is that Hashem will make you that partner and then provide you individual reward based on your decisions. So here they felt so far away, they felt too individualized as they cut off the absolute oneness with the source and they started to uh, begin avoid the Zara, God forbid. And they started offering sacrifices to Avodah to appease the ministers. And they made incense offerings. So if you go any place and people are offering incense to like any little, you know, getch, just run away. You don't want any incense. I'm not talking about some hippie thing that just, you know, some nice, some nice smelling uh, 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 herb. I don't mean that type of herb. That Hashem put in the world for medicinal purposes. 
not recreational purposes. But I mean, you go to a place and they have nice, you know, potpourri or something. But if somebody is taking herbs and they're offering it to a power, that's called idol worship. Is that they're going to intermediaries and not going to Hashem. Yes, Mordechai. So, um, one thing that I kind of start with understanding when, as we're talking about, like, uh, I guess, talking to intermediaries versus Hashem himself, is, I guess, either davening at a Saudi's grave or doing the Saudi for, for a bracha. Obviously, you know, I'm not going to deny the you know, special connection that, you know, a Saudi has with Hashem and how they can help you, but in another way, I do kind of see it as, like, you're going to an intermediary as opposed to Hashem himself. So, you should go to Hashem and speak to Hashem as much as you can. At Sadiq, the idea is, is that they are very, very much on good terms with Hashem. They have spent their entire life just dedicated to doing God's will. And Hashem said, anybody who does my will, I'll do their will. And therefore, the idea of a bracha is it's, you're, you're using the power of Hashem. That Hashem created a system where people who listen to Hashem nonstop, they will have a certain power to bestow blessing and Hashem will listen to them. If, um, not me, you know, I hope to be doing Hashem's will, but let's say some guy, we'll call him, you know, Shmo. So Shmo, Shmo. yeah, Shmo? Sounds awfully similar, Rabbi, trying to talk about everyone here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Shmo, so if he doesn't do Hashem's will, even if he goes to Hashem, so Hashem says like, let me open up the books, let me do an audit to see are you worthy of this? Is this, uh, you know, you've been going against me for so long, you might not have the merit that this would be something that I would give you. And therefore, you're aware of that. You could still talk to Hashem and you should. But what you understand is that hopefully you're smart enough as you realize that if I go to a righteous person, is that they have a tremendous merit. I understand the technology that Hashem set it up, that anybody who listens to Hashem, Measure for measure, Hashem will listen to them and provide that thing. And therefore, it's just, it's being smart. As far as going to the grave of a tzaddik, what you're doing is you're saying that this person, like we mentioned, that people who have passed on and are righteous, even when they're dead, they're called alive. So they're up now in Shemayim and they're advocating on your behalf. It's like going, you know, we hope a person doesn't have to go to court, but if a person's in court, so sometimes, even if they could plead the case, when you have somebody that knows how to present the case properly, like a good lawyer, so you let them speak because they know how to present it in a way that's going to be meritous for the person. So tzaddikim know how to find all your good points and all your redeeming qualities, and they're just speaking on your behalf to Hashem. But you also should speak to Hashem. But while a person is still... Uh, becoming more and more righteous and speaking to Hashem nonstop, there is a benefit in going to somebody who totally sees you as good and can speak to Hashem on your behalf. You're not, you're not praying to Him. He's just speaking on your behalf to Hashem. That's totally fine. He's speaking, advocating for you. And sometimes a person can't advocate for themselves. Let's say you have a child. A child, some, somebody uh, stole something from a child. So, you know, you have to go to the authorities. So the child doesn't know how to advocate and say, you know, this guy, like, you know, he stole my candy bar. Uh, he, he doesn't know how to provide all the details. So we appoint an apotropus. We appoint somebody who could speak on behalf of the child. So sometimes if we're a bit uh, childish still, and even though we're 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, but we still act in childish ways, in immature ways, Sometimes it's just logical that I, I have somebody that could speak on my behalf, that they could present uh, the points in a way that would be redeeming for me. The destination is only one, though, Hashem. It's always Hashem, nothing else. That's the hardcore monotheistic view of the Jew, is there's nothing and no other power that is the source of what we're looking for than Hashem. The problem here is they felt like, I can't go to Hashem. And therefore, I'm going to go to an intermediary and ask him. I'm not asking the tzaddik to give me his blessing. He's just 
bringing a, he's just a conduit bringing the blessing from Hashem because he was advocating on your behalf. Here, though, what they said is, I, I, we don't go to Hashem. We're going to start becoming chummy chummy with the angelic forces. And he goes on. They also knew how to, what's called, to take certain oaths and make angels do things. They could basically make the angels swear to do different things. We talk about this when we talk about demons. The people can swear and make demons do certain things, like find lost items and stuff. We said it's dangerous, but this is what people do when they go off the derech. They don't come to yeshiva. And they're doing more than just, you know, watching movies all day. Is, yeah. That they would go to the angels and they would, they would do, you know, it would appeal to them, you know, give me this and give me that. You know, the, you, know, you think like, oh, like the sun dance, the rain dance, you know, the, this, this, is, this is hardcore idol worship that still goes on. Wait, it actually had power? Yeah. Because you're going to the intermediaries that Hashem set up. You have a president, and the president has ministers. You have the minister of the interior, the minister of finance, the minister of the... So the minister is actually doling out, you know, the money. He's dividing up the land. But he has no authority except what the president gives. But if you go to him and you say, like, you cut a deal... Backdoor. Yeah. So th you, yeah, that's right. You start lobbying for, you know, this, that, and the other... Now you could see, you know, where you know, modern-day crookedness could come in. That, that there's a problem there. So we're talking about lobbying, like, don't go to, I can't go to Hashem anymore to ask for Parnassah. I can't go to Hashem anymore to ask for health. But I could go to this angel of health, and I could use certain incantations. Or I could go to the, 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 the buffalo spirit, and I can, I can appeal to the buffalo spirit that sh there should be a good herd this year. That's a major problem. We're not talking about having a respect for, you know, for buffalo species on this world. We have respect for all animals and all life. But when you start talking about putting on animal headdresses and arousing the spirits of those animals and doing certain incantations. We're talking about real idol worship. So this is where it started to break down. And the Nefesh Chaim talks about this. And we have the same thing nowadays when it comes to me feeling like I'm independent. That is the, that is the venom of the snake is that we began all this from our discussion of Hashem being the source of all, from Hashem's perspective, all there is, is Hashem. The more that I become aware of the light moving further away, so to speak, I take on more self-identity as separate from Hashem. Hashem becomes more and more distant. I start appealing to the different forces, God forbid. And that is all the same venom of the snake. What is the fixing of that? Making sure to return, this is tshuva, return to the source where I come from and know really I'm never separate from source. Everything I have comes from you, Hashem. And to make sure every moment of your day, you're only looking to Hashem as the real source and hope for everything we need. We should be zoycha, my dear friends, to know that Hashem is the only address and it's what we think about every single day. And the entire Tanya we're learning about is one explanation of Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. That is what the Jew thinks about nonstop. God, you're the only address. We should be zarech to this. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day, my dear friends. Shabbos Kodesh.